Africa was Europe's playground as the colonial powers of France, Britain, Belgium and Portugal sliced up the continent with straight lines, tearing through cultures and communities and leaving nothing when they realized their days were numbered as more African states sought independence. Yet with colonialism allegedly gone, the shadows of the past still linger over Africa. But even though the apologies come in thick and fast surrounding the mistakes of the past, one has to question whether the apologies are genuine and whether the exploitation is ongoing. Aucun des autres pays que vous avez cité ne partage la langue, la culture, les rêves de la Côte d'Ivoire et du continent africain comme la France. Aucun. Mais trop souvent aujourd'hui, la France est perçue avec un regard d'hégémonie ou les oripeaux d'un colonialisme qui a été et qui fut une erreur profonde, une faute de la République. In spite of the apologies, conflict still rage on as a result of colonialization. And of course, this in turn affects the food chain supply as much of the food produced in Africa gets sent elsewhere, leaving those in conflict situations both in fear of their physical safety and hungry. There are also quite a number of conflict uh, countries, especially within the lecture, within the Sahel, and then also the existing ones uh, yeah, in Somalia, in South Sudan, in Central African Republic. Uh, so when you look at those uh, conflicts, it has also broad challenges because even when food is available, it is not affordable and it, is, it cannot reach those conflict areas. Hello and welcome to the Economic Divide with me, Kabatapwe. In this week's episode of the show, we will be looking into the details of a report by War on Wants and ascertain whether colonialism and exploitation still play a part in the role of food production and distribution in Africa. Don't forget, we want to hear from you, so why not join us by logging onto our Twitter account using our marker at sign ed underscore program. We'd love to hear about the stories and inequalities that affect you, so make sure you share them with us. And who knows, in a future episode, we may just cover your story. Let's start with some figures. The current industrial food system only produces about 30% of the world's food, with 75% of the global agricultural land being exploited by agribusiness companies that produce export-bound produce, leaving the growing nation with little in return. One major issue for the likes of North Africa and the rest of the Meadow region is the amount of imported food that they have to rely on. For the likes of wheat, corn, rice, and poultry, accounting for in excess of 20 to 30 percent of the global market of imports, but back into the region that they were grown. One of the main issues that affects North Africa, um, and also what's known as the MENA region, in particular are complaints by activists who say the state indulgence with agricultural and fishing capitalists have been using the coronavirus pandemic as an excuse to lay off their workers, giving the companies running such ventures more favorable figures to their shareholders and managers at the expense of the laborers and farmers at the bottom. North Africa, in particular Morocco and Tunisia, has long been a fertile area on the continent, in particular when it comes to the production and cultivation of food produce, with both countries also enjoying an amazing and unique food culture. Whereas to this day, North Africa enjoys certain advantages on the food market, since the 19th century, the area has been plagued by the notion of colonialism, which of course brought with it an exploitation opportunity for the occupying powers, and in particular, France. One of the main issues facing the area is the reliance on exporting food produce abroad. Many of the products, which are also highly water-reliant, means that the possibility for local production and consumption is affected, with the area importing more than 50% of their food as a result. With the issue clearly apparent, one has to raise the question as to the cause. And in the case of Morocco and Tunisia, agricultural policies have been determined by political elites, both nationally and from abroad as well as having the added issue of transnational corporation, which in the case of food production, are usually some very big fish in the industry. This has led to the marginalization of smaller farms and food producers in the region, with conflicts emerging over land and access to water, which means that whatever precious water there was before is often scooped up by the big producers, exporting water-heavy goods, such as watermelons, tomatoes, strawberries, 
all of which are Europe banned, rather than staying local. Attempts are being made by outside organisations such as War on Want and Siada, who are raising awareness on the issue and attempting to fight the capitalist firms that are plundering local resources, destroying the environment and taking away the livelihoods of all the local people to suit their own corporate needs. Morocco went a step further and tried to cease activity with the EU, not only in food production and export, but across a whole range of services. The exploitation of countries in Africa stemming from colonialization is still in place, with France still holding the national reserves of 14 African countries, with more than 80% of foreign reserves of these nations placed in the French treasury. When it comes to natural resources, food production and commerce, former French colonial nations are forced to give preference to French interests and companies first, which for the food industry sees the likes of Carrefour, Ochan and others taking the majority of food produced in the region back to France. Going beyond food, the French also have a quasi-monopoly over many other former colonial nations' resources with electricity, telecommunications, infrastructure, and airports and harbors all being exploited by France, and hence removing the notion of sovereignty from the likes of Morocco, Tunisia, and beyond. Africa has long been a hub of colonial exploitation, from the beginning of the invasion of foreign forces in Africa that saw the birth of slavery, to the ongoing and clearly legacy-based system of natural resources being exploited in Africa. To this day, various multinational companies are omnipresent in the African continent, from the likes of mining companies who are still shifting out tons of valuable African minerals, precious metals and of course precious stones such as diamonds, rubies and opals. Furthermore, with France, for example, still being a dominant power in Africa, the insistence by the French for its former colonies to use the standard single currency that it controls, as well as demanding the majority of the foreign currency of such countries to be stored in France, just goes to show that the imperialist grip France had on Africa is still very much in place. Many of the major services in Africa are run by French or French-connected enterprises, with the likes of telecommunications, water, electricity and gas all under the banners and the flags of the likes of France Telecom, EDF, GDF, and a whole range more. But are African nations able to exit from the controlling powers of the one-time colonial powers that ruled over them? The problem may not be coming solely from the foreign powers that once ruled over Africa, but also stem from the governments and powers from within Africa. One such example is the fishing industry, which has seen the likes of Gambia, the Ivory Coast and others sell out their fishing rights to large EU-based trawlers and mass producers, which not only diminish the stocks of the fish supply in the sea that could be instead be feeding the locals, but the fishing also has a terrible effect on the environment, killing off local wildlife as trawlers do their damage. Luckily, however, there are people out there who are trying to raise awareness of the issue for all to see and attempt to put an end to the ongoing exploitation in Africa. Joining me in the studio today is Mustafa Mane. He is an environmental activist, journalist, and researcher from Gambia in Western Africa. He pays particular attention to the exploitation of African resources from foreign nations and campaigns to raise awareness on the issue through his Twitter feed, where he posts videos and information on the issue. Mustafa, many thanks for joining us today. It's a pleasure, thank you. Okay, uh, in terms of the first question that I have for you, tell us a little bit about how European nations are using African nations for their own needs, particularly in the exploitation of agricultural resources, food production, and also the distribution of food. Well, um, the European nations, just like uh, many other um, um, uh, countries or continents, are exploiting our uh, natural resources. Uh, this is usually through what they call the so-called bilateral relationship with Gambia. For example, the clear um, um, sample for that is the EU-Gambian fishing um, agreement, which is a complete um, um, exploitation of our natural resources. And um, 
for the fact Gambia has only 80 um, um, kilometers, that is the length of our our coast. And um, having um, understand that the Gambia is extremely poor, uh, they are vulnerable and they cannot like reject offers from um, the European Union. And um, they also use the weak leadership of our country to um, to make sure that they um, they explode the resources. What about offshore issues? If you can tell us about that. We know that certain EU and foreign ships are trawling the coast of Africa for things like fish, which leaves little left for local demand. Well, the the, the biggest exploders of our, of our marine resources are the Chinese. Gambia only resource or natural resource, I, I always say, is um, is is the money resource. But if these people are fishing it, and the Gambia is is um, is facing like when it comes to fish, the price is very high. Uh, we started seeing this uh, in 2015 to 2020 when the Gambia start having um, a new investment called a fish mill factory within the Gambia. Then we have three fish mill factories, and these factories, um, they produce or they use uh, a pelagic fish resources that are, that are the Bunga and the Sardinia. And these are the same type of fish that Gambians can afford because they are very cheap to afford. But the factory is producing in, in thousands of tons every day. Like, when that happens, the people suffer the most. And finally, um, when we take a look at... Um what's being done about raising the awareness. Are local governments actually taking this issue seriously? Are they acting accordingly? It's, it's very unfortunate when it comes to Gambia. The government is not taking things seriously. Anything that involves the Europeans, anything that involves the Chinese, anything that involves the foreign countries, the Gambia government become powerless. Country that depends highly on grants and loans cannot make its own decisions. And these are the loans that they gave them to remedy the problems that are already caused by this um, 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 so-called donors or, 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 or like bilateral that are, we all know cannot, like personally, I know it cannot sustain the Gambia. Okay, thank you very much for that. We appreciate it, Mustafa. Many thanks for being with us. It's a pleasure. Thank you so much. Okay, that was Mustafa Mane. If uh, you want to find out more about him and his work, make sure you log on to his Twitter page, at sign Mustafa Mane 4, where you can follow all of his latest campaigns. The details of the page are on your screens now. We're going to take a quick break here on Economic Divide, but don't go anywhere as we have plenty more coming up. We're going to take a look at various economic events happening around the world in our Info News section. We're also joined by Sarah Abadi, another new face here on Economic Divide, as she runs through thoughts and traits happening in the world of social media. We're also going to take a look at what Morocco and Tunisia are doing to make themselves more self-sufficient, as well as looking into how conflict is having an impact on food and food security in Africa. So don't go away. We'll be right back after this short message. Time now for the Info News section of our program where we take a look at headlines from around the world. First, a look at poverty in Germany. The country's state-owned website and media, Deutsche Welle, known as DW, ran this headline, Poverty Threatens Even More People in Germany. It stated that the past 10 years have seen an increasing number of people in Germany at risk of falling below the poverty line. In one large city, nearly a quarter of residents fall into this category. Now that U.S. presidential candidate Joe Biden has picked Kamala Harris for a VP position, have you wondered what a Biden and Harris administration would mean for the economy? Biden's economic plans is focused mainly on raising money. He plans to increase the corporate tax rate from 21% to 28%, which is a big hike in some uh, ways, and it could raise about a trillion dollars to the year 2030. As for Kamala Harris, well, she's just gonna be a bystander to this process. Finally, calls for the postponement or delay of the IDB, the Interdevelopment bank is growing louder. Now this is a bank that's located in Latin America, but why is this happening in the first place? It cites COVID-19 as the reason, but it runs deeper than that. 
For the first time, the U.S. has named a candidate to head the bank, which has always been led by someone from the Latin American region. The U.S. holds a 30% stake in the bank and has traditionally nominated a vice president. Now let's take a look at what other initiatives and programs Morocco and Tunisia have in order to wean themselves away from France and begin to impose their own self-sufficiency. Whereas many nations in Africa have limited resources, which once exploited, leave them with very little to offer, some African nations have an added advantage that can in some cases make up for the loss of earnings in agriculture, namely in the form of alternative sources of income. For both Morocco and Tunisia alike, one of the main sources of income away from agriculture is tourism, with both nations enjoying a highly developed tourism trade. However, in recent times, the impact of the COVID-19 virus has had a massive effect on business as the leisure and service industry suffers one of the largest economic setbacks in history. There are also a limited number of resources in the area that are typically local, with the likes of dates, fruits, olives, argon oil and saffron all doing very well for the local economy, albeit on a smaller scale to that of the multinational production, which has taken the majority of the produce out of Africa. It's the smaller end of the scale which has attracted businesses and tourism to Africa, which not only enjoys a culture and weather that's pleasant, but also enjoys better security than other parts of the region. With tourism bringing in consumers seeking sun, sand, handicrafts and souvenirs, the ability to adapt to new forms of tourism are also an important step in aiding the nations that rely on income from abroad. Morocco has taken things a step further by trying to develop itself as a self-sufficient nation, with one of the main examples seeing the country develop its own and ever-increasingly important solar panel industry in order to generate its own electricity. With various alternatives available, how long will it be then before other African nations take heed and attempt to become self-sufficient? And until then, will the ongoing investment in Africa from around the world help the locals? Or will it be a case of false promises in order to continue to exploit the poorest people? I'm pleased to say that joining us in this section of Economic Divide is another new social media commentator, Sara Abadi. Sara, many thanks for being with us today. Hi, thank so, you. Uh, tell us what you have for our first, for your first post. Yeah, actually, there are three tweets on food sovereignty in Africa. So, the first tweet, if it's going to be shown, yeah. Uh, this is uh, on the uh, War on One report uh, that suggested that the uh, North Africa was being devastated by uh, the influence of foreign experts on their crops and produce. Uh, however, it just goes that uh, some uh, things are being done by uh, people actually that are uh, uh, rising up against the um, uh, the larger food corporations and making sure that they have a cause uh, for food sovereignty. What do you have for your next post to hear? Yeah. Yeah, this is a kind of uh, proposing some kind of a solution for the uh, exploitation problem, as it was mentioned in the last video, uh, which is the investment and trust at the uh, uh, grassroots level of uh, local farmers in Africa. Uh, so, uh, by giving them the opportunity to be uh, self-sufficient, uh, it not only solves the problem of uh, preparing and providing food resources for the region, uh, but also it creates a lot of job opportunities and uh, it avoids uh, some, uh, actually, uh, foreign firms to exploit the land. And for your last post. Yeah, the last post actually sheds some uh, light on the future. Uh, by uh, uh, expressing uh, and uh, explaining some programs on uh, educating children and the next generation um, on uh, actually uh, run their own businesses and uh, provide their own resources, food resources. Uh, there's a program which is called STEP, as you see there, the Start Them Early program, uh, which educates and uh, uh, teach children, uh, teaches children to um, actually um, 
practically learn how to uh, provide their own food and uh, uh, work on their own business, small business, from the early ages Very as well. well. Thank you so much for that. We appreciate it, Sarah. Uh, everybody, uh, her first time, but uh, with many great uh, posts that uh, she chose. Also, like to take take a quick time here to. Uh, um, appreciate the Warren Want and the report that they did. Uh, they have not only the information that they presented in the form of a report, but also uh, the videos, uh, they had two of them, in which they presented uh, the experiences of some of the farmers when it comes to how uh, resources and uh, their positions in the agriculture, et cetera, is being exploited. Uh, so uh, at this point, we're gonna now take a look at the next uh, report, which uh, covers conflict and war. It can be argued that Africa was a relatively peaceful continent until the arrival of the colonial powers that divided the continent along lines that did not reflect the culture, people or anything with the area, hence causing a division that's been yet to be healed. To this day, the divide and rule legacy left behind by the Europeans is still causing endless wars in Africa, which bring with it more than just a security dilemma for those wishing to avoid the conflict but the fallout of the wars are having an impact on the food security around the conflict-stricken countries and beyond. Des milliers de personnes ont été tuées. D'autres ont dû fuir de leur localité pour se mettre à l'abri. Nous avons besoin de les aider pour se reconstituer. Ils ont tout perdu. Ils n'ont même pas pour produire pendant plusieurs saisons. Si la communauté internationale ne faisait rien, la situation va se détériorer. The coronavirus saw the United Nations Secretary General, Antonio Guterres, call for all armed conflicts around the world to cease fire in order to deal with the issue. Yet it's something that has yet to materialize, with the access to food and food security still a major issue in conflict areas. Now, immediate humanitarian actions are therefore needed to stop any potential catastrophe in the coming month. At the same time, the fighting and going in the country and the insecurity need to be stopped. The insecurity caused by conflict also leads to severe famine in certain cases when food distribution is hindered due to the ongoing intrastate conflicts. In places such as Sudan, Chad and the Democratic Republic of Congo or suffering terrible humanitarian disasters due to food shortages. Add to the conflict the notion of environmental issues such as plagues, droughts and crop failures, and the security issues are multiplied further as the movement of people aiming to escape the issue bring with them a whole new threat as displacement of people doesn't make the problem necessarily go away, but more so drags the baggage of poverty, conflict and hunger with them. There's no doubt that the cause of such issues comes from colonialism. However, in spite of false statements and theatrical performances of apologies, no colonial power is really doing anything to improve the situation in the modern day. Africa has been described as a cradle of life for its ancient culture, history, and its people, with the continent rich in many different resources. Hence why the European colonial powers jumped at the chance to occupy the diverse land. However, even though we have seen many African states gain independence away from the colonial occupiers, the influence of the past has yet to fully subside, with the likes of France, Britain, Portugal, and Belgium still heavily influencing the continent. With new powers such as China, now also investing heavily in Africa, the notion of being able to become fully self-sufficient seems to be a long ways away from many. Yet things are starting to show signs of improvement, nonetheless, as environmental and economic issues are regularly raised by the people who live in and care for Africa. Don't forget, we always want to hear from you, our dear viewers, on the subject that matter to you. So check out our Twitter page using at sign ed underscore program, where you can message us, share stories, and catch up on all of our latest news. You can also catch this episode of the show and all of our past episodes again by logging onto our website and clicking on Shows. Our content is available 24-7 across the globe. That's about all the time we have for this week's show. I've been Kavita Hui, and on behalf of myself and the whole team here on Economic Divide, thanks for watching. 
We'll see you again next time.